Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for stress test. And in the crypto sphere, the two biggest drivers still seem to be fear and greed. With emotions running the show, there is a serious need for the industry to develop more accurate metrics. Fortunately, today we have with us two people who can help us to understand things from a new perspective. The Thai co-founder Joshua Frank and John Purifoy, CEO of Floating Point Group. This week's theme, barriers to institutional cryptocurrency adoption, the four major problems facing the industry. Gentlemen, firstly, welcome, so, welcome to Block TV and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right, so to kick off this week, let's see number one. You've got four major problems. What's the first and most important thing you see as plaguing the crypto industry? Yeah, so the first, the first issue that we're seeing, and it's something that has improved over time but, but remains to be an issue, is the fact that the, the foundations of dig, digital asset data are still being built. So we're really still early. And, and the way that we, we look at digital asset data is, is kind of in, in five different sectors. The first is market data. So, so pricing data, the second is on-chain data. So actually fundamentally understanding what's going on on the individual blockchain. So things like hash rate, uh, things like difficulty uh, on proof of work networks, um, development activity and foundation health, uh, corporate actions and significant development and sentiment data. So over time, we've seen that, that this market has matured a bit. Um, even, even two years ago, back in 2017, when, when the bull run happened, really the only thing that existed was market data. Uh, and that market data was really lacking in terms of, you know, pricing was fine, but volume had always been an issue. But the market didn't really understand anything else. And it's not like crypto has any fundamentals. There was nothing fundamentally driving the value of the asset class. So we've seen that parts of, of, of crypto data have begun to, to mature a bit more, but we're still not fully there. So what we're working on at the tie is, you know, is sentiment as, as we've talked about in the past, but also we think that there needs to be a big push towards corporate actions and significant developments. And what I mean by that is in the equity world, you have this idea of a corporate action. So for example, a dividend or a stock split. In crypto, you have very similar ideas, but nobody's really tracking those. So in crypto, an example of, of, a, of a dividend is like a hard fork, right? Where you're turning one cryptocurrency into two by forking the code. And there needs to be, you know, there needs to be ways for institutional investors to be able to track this, to put these on a calendar, and to really understand what's going on. And from an on-chain perspective, we, we also think the market is, is very immature, and that there are really interesting ways to, for example, measure hash rate combined with new miners moving onto the market. Where, when, when new miners are, 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 are purchased and bought, um, those, those miners you know, you know, increase the hash rate of the network uh, and increase the difficulty so that the old mining equipment that was on the market before and the people that have, have that mining equipment their margins are reduced in terms of in terms of what they're actually making uh, off of mining crypto, and that creates a lot of selling pressure in the market. So we think there's a there's a big opportunity to fundamentally understand from the supply side, uh, you know, economics of of what's causing you know you know increased supplies to go on the market of, of proof of work networks as well. I, I wonder as well, uh, just sort of wondering aloud here with you, is the issue and the fact that there is insufficient data in the industry. I mean, it's interesting when it comes to blockchain because you think there with the distributed ledger facet of the technology that the access to the data is relatively easier than in a lot of other industries. But at the same time, the decentralized nature often means that there's a lack of governance, let's say, or direct corporate responsibility in terms of the overall nature of the chain itself. Do you think that is what's holding back some of this data industry? And how is the market going to overcome that? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think the, the problem isn't lack of data. The problem is lack of quality data. And there, there's a problem with the focus on, on what the data is actually on. So lots of people have gone out and released websites that look at, you know, a bunch of different data, but nobody cares about the correlation between that data and price. Um, you know, people are just like, oh, this is some interesting data about the blockchain network, but what does it actually have to do with movement within the market? Another example is like, we think it's really important to understand development activity. So understanding, you know, how much development activity is actually occurring on EOS or on Ethereum or on any of these, you know, other altcoins. But the issue is just looking at GitHub, which a lot of people have done, that's not sufficient because GitHub is very easily manipulated. You can, you know, very easily fork a repository or commit code, but nobody's actually, you know, auditing the quality of that code or looking at the changes that have actually been made to, to your GitHub. So we, we think that also is, is, is part of the issue that it's not just lack of data, it's lack of quality data. 
Okay, certainly something that needs to be developed in the industry, but let's now move on to your point number two in what's holding back the industry. And this I understand to be quite US centric, but what have you got for us there? Yeah, so in terms of regulation, I think that the key thing to first comment on is that crypto is global, right? I think versus a lot of other asset classes, which sometimes have fungibility questions, crypto can simultaneously be traded in the US and as well as abroad. And what this means is that when you're starting a company or you're working in a financial firm or you're doing a hedge fund, you have serious questions over what's the advantage of staying in the US or going internationally. And you know, one of the questions there is this uncertainty. And Josh was kind of mentioning this early in terms of that there hasn't been clear guidance really given on where those lines are. So we're seeing a number of firms actually migrating out of the US as a result of this, right? Poloniex in 2019, similarly Binance actually pulling out of US and launching with BAM actually this week in the US. The point being that, you know, a lot of these firms are doing cost benefit analysis over, you know, why stay in the U.S. versus go abroad. And that's actually creating a huge problem. Right. So the U.S. is really not crypto friendly and it's causing a cascade of issues. The second point on this, which is within the U.S. as well as internationally, is that ETFs and other exchange traded products, as SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce is kind of noting, you know, these don't actually seem to be on the horizon. And people in the crypto community kind of always talk about ETFs and really excited about it and seeing how they can actually change it and modify. But at the end of the day, the problem being that unless these ETFs really come to maturity, unless they're actually able to figure out the fundamental problems around, you know, what is the manipulation of the markets? Is there enough liquidity in it? What are the preferences given? Then there's actually some serious problems with ETFs. And there's been some back and forth on this. But fundamentally, the problem still remains that these ETFs don't appear. And the next comment to really say is kind of bit license, but regulation as a whole, right? Within the US and in many parts of the world, like fintech regulation is overwhelmingly pretty substantial, right? Most estimates place it that it takes around 400 to 500,000 to do most fintech businesses. And if you're within, say, capital markets infrastructure working in crypto, that can be exponentiated. And so this means that a lot of companies have huge barriers to even get started. Some countries have actually taken pretty novel approaches to that, right? So most of Europe is actually starting to create regulatory sandboxes where these companies can come in, fly within a set of constraints, and actually be able to build a business that's representative of that. The U.S., on the other hand, has been a little bit slow to adopt on a couple of those fronts. And I think that caused a lot of problems. The New York bit license is probably the most salient example of that, where you're seeing a pretty large hurdle when only you know, 16, 17 are given out. It's difficult to really be able to get substantial operations in that capacity. Now, I say all this, and probably the really key factor here is, well, what is the purpose of the regulation? Right? What is the purpose of this crypto regulation? And at the end of the day, it's probably for twofold issues. And you're seeing this in the enforcement. One, it's for scams. Right? You're seeing a large amount of issues in which people are either being fraudulently communicated with sales and securities or other stuff like that. And probably the other aspect is just that there's a lot of questions around AML and KYC over how money can be transferred and how money can be funded. And so I think when you think about regulation, you got to understand that regulators are coming out from that perspective. They want to protect people from scams and using money for money laundering. And then the question is, how do you build a system that enables that? So then I suppose I've got to wonder as well, obviously, as you pointed out, this isn't just a US domestic market. This is a truly global market. And you spoke about the comparisons between different jurisdictions in that matter. But is there just a chance that as other jurisdictions move ahead, the reliance on US markets will diminish and make it that the US simply gets left behind in this situation while others are able to pull ahead? And is that so terrible for the industry as well, looking outside the sort of purely American perspective? No, no, I think it's actually a really good point, right? I think crypto founded itself on this idea of decentralization, of enabling global monetary supplies, of decreasing the hegemony of the US dollar, right? So I think in that capacity, you're actually exactly right, right? Like, I don't think you can strictly say like, oh, US power decreasing is bad or US power decreasing is good, right? Like that's, that's, that kind of depends on where you are in libertarian philosophies. I think what you can definitely say is that traditionally speaking, a large number of financial institutions have migrated towards US centric domiciles, right? Like New York or places like that, where you're seeing a large flow, a large amount of capital. And when those kind of people that have been known as the leaders aren't kind of leading, right? When they're not actually setting out what the regulation should be, when they're not setting out clear expectations, then not only is it kind of bad for the community because people look to the leaders and they ask what's going on, but it's kind of bad for the overall population. Because at the end of the day, we look to those places, we look to, you know, the US regulatory bottles to kind of figure out what's going on. 
And in a lot of capacities, that's just not happening. And I think, you know, in a, in a similar vein, uh, Hester Pierce was, was interviewed by Long Hash, I believe, either today or yesterday. And a comment she made was just worrying about the brain drain, right? If, if the U.S. doesn't, you know, kind of get their shit together, for lack of better terms, um, you know, the brain drain will occur. I mean, you know, Singapore is becoming a, an absolutely massive hub for crypto, uh, and 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 top companies are are going to move out of the United States. Um, you know, it's and I and both of us can say that that isn't you know that that is something that we've at at, at some point at least considered um, because of how you know not just restrictive the U.S. regulation is, but how much how how much lack of clarity there actually is. I mean, sitting with our lawyers and trying to figure things out. It is in, it's it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly expensive, and there's there's not always a resolution to, to things. Yeah, certainly, that lack of clarity is problematic. But that lack of clarity doesn't only come from the regulators. And I suppose this takes us neatly to our third point for today, and one of our favorite topics here on Stress Test to discuss. You and I, Joshua, have uh, discussed this many <laughs> times: the issue of manipulation in the markets. Uh, what can you tell us? Yeah, so, you know, the crypto market still has so many different forms of manipulations and uh, manipulation and, and, you know, things just continue to to pop up. Um, but but one example of it and one thing that still exists is pay to play articles and Breaker Mag, um, who, which was a great publication that unfortunately closed earlier this year, released a report in October 2018 where they basically went out to crypto news outlets and they asked if they'd post a positive story about a particular cryptocurrency. Uh, and more than 50% of them uh, said they would do that for money. Uh, and, and we see that continue to occur. Um, I have friends that work at particular crypto projects and on a daily basis, they get sent, um, you know, sent emails saying, hey, you know, if you give us two grand or three grand, we'll write a positive article about your crypto or we'll recommend you. The same thing goes, up, goes on for not just cryptocurrencies, but exchanges as well, um, where a lot of the, the news that you're seeing within the crypto market remains to be pay to play. Um, and in a similar vein, you know, ICO reviews was, was, were, were absolutely huge. You had ICO alert and ICO bench and ICO review and all these companies. Um, and, and I can't speak to the, the trustworthiness of all of them, but the SEC cracked down on, uh, on one of the research and rating providers earlier this year, uh, because they were basically taking money to, to give positive reviews to particular ICOs without disclosing that. So they would say, oh, this is a five-star ICO and you should put your money in it. Um, without saying that, hey, we got paid to say that. Um, you know, an, another, another point that we've talked about and, and, you know, Bitwise has, and it's a continued discussion. And I think this is actually one of the things that's improved the most within the ecosystem is manipulated trading volumes. And when I mean it's improved the most, you know, it, it's, it's become front of mind to a lot of companies within crypto. Uh, CoinMarketCap has taken initiative. Crypto Compare has done a ton of great things. We've done a, you know, we've done a bit of research as well. Uh, Mazzari, I mean, there are you know, countless companies in the industry that are, that are trying to clean up this, this mess and, and come up with better ways to actually measure volumes uh, on crypto exchanges. And the last bit is thing that we, we covered more recently, but that's fake social activity with these networks actually paying, um, basically paying to, to have their coins promoted on, on individual, uh, on platforms like Twitter. And, and it, it's so clearly obvious how that's done um, one, one example of that is, is all these cryptocurrencies had, uh, you know, these bounty programs. So when, when, when cryptos used, when these ICOs used to get released in 2016, 2017, even early 2018, the announcement we made on, on the Bitcoin talk, on Bitcoin talk on the ANN forums. And, and as part of the announcement, they'd basically say, Hey, if you pump our crypto, we'll pay you a certain amount of the future token supply. Yeah, certainly, it uh, is a uh, bold, bold-faced schemes in uh, in some instances, and still so much rampant manipulation. And the distinction between promotion and uh, proper journalism, something we're hopefully trying to work on here ourselves at Block TV. But this takes us to our last point. Uh, you seem to have made this one quite succinctly, uh, but perhaps that's all it needs to be made. Crypto still pretty young. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you could say that. You can see it in a couple of different lenses, right? Capital markets, there's a couple of components, right? So for instance, when you execute a trade, say you go on like E-Trade or someone like that, and you like say you buy something, right? You're going through an interface, which goes through E-Trade, which is a brokerage house, which on the back end then goes through several things, right? There's like a reporting requirement that send those trades to the correct bodies. There's people that actually do risk management on that to make sure that trade's actually handled appropriately, and ultimately route them to the market, right? 
And then finally, you have an exchange where that's transacted on. In crypto, none of that exists, right? In crypto, people are literally going on exchanges, treating the exchanges as a bank, a custody providers, as an individual place for settlement. You're seeing a consolidation of that. And that counterparty risk, that heightened counterparty risk, causes huge problems in the market. There's a couple of these that we could really talk about, right? The first is significant arbitrage opportunities, right? We're still seeing a persistent about, oh, we still see a very persistent amount of like one to two percent of actual arbitrage between various markets. There was actually a report earlier this year in like quantitative finance that was studying how those trends have gone over time, and it's actually interesting. It's reduced about ten to fifty times since mid 2017 slash late 2017 when things were being very high and very heightened. But you're still seeing huge premiums of a lot of this arbitrage, and that's actually causing a lot of problems because you know if people are being haircut or making you know these various amounts, it leads to a lot of questions in the market. That's probably the first. The second is when you actually talk about the tools, right? We talked about consolidation of this risk earlier, where all these parties are really being one, and that's just not heard of in really other asset classes. Particularly custody is probably easy to see, right? So it's estimated that about a billion to two billion a year is stolen in crypto funds. And you know, for any investor who's getting into an asset class, that kind of tail risk is very scary, right? Whenever you're trying to allocate to an asset class, you know, and maybe you'll make 10 or 20 percent a year, if there's a downside or a tail risk of literally losing all your capital, unquestionably that gives you pause of entering the asset class. So that's still a huge issue. And you know, going right on that is settlement. So one thing to really note about crypto is credit systems, right? If I put money, say, on Binance. Then I can't use that same money to buy on Coinbase. You know, there's a problem because it locks up your credit, and that credit's actually a huge problem when you're trying to execute large orders, right? If you're trying to buy, say, a million dollars or ten million dollars of currencies, then not having buying power on multiple venues can lead to serious issues. Traditionally, that's solved with settlement, right? The largest firm for that being the DTCC within the United States, but in crypto, those really don't exist. Um, there's no real way to have money on one exchange fund trades on another. Maybe have money in a bank that being able to fund positions across multiple, and that then leads to just the host of other issues, right? Around like how do you actually get loans? How do you get collateralized systems? How can you actually go short on some of these assets? There's kind of a host of problems around that. But the point being that those tools don't exist. So I think when you look at this market from two fronts, when you look at it from a quantitative study. And you really see that these significant arbitrage opportunities still exist, where you're having, you know, people selling it up to one percent different prices. And then on the other aspect, when you're looking at the tools and there's such massive tail risk, I think it, to say that crypto is immature is almost kind of a, a trivial statement, right? I, th- I think you can probably even go farther than that. Yeah, certainly, it seems that there's so much development left to go in the market, so much left to yet be done. Unfortunately, gentlemen, we can't do it all today, so we'll have to leave it there for now. But I want to thank you, gentlemen, so much, Joshua Frank and John Purefoy, for helping us to break down some of these major issues that still need to be dealt with with such a young market. We've got plenty of time, though, gentlemen. I look forward to over the next days, weeks, months, and years ahead discussing with you fellas how we're going to fix this market and getting it done. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining us, and stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.